It's always such a pleasure to be back. Um, my son has an electric car, um, a Nis Nissan Leaf, isn't it? He says that when he travels long distance, he tries to get into the tailwind of an articulated lorry and kind of save energy by just following these big lorries. And that's how we feel about Barnabas. So let's get in their tailwind and just sort of just save energy by, doing, uh, by linking in with them because you're such an inspiration and a support to us. So bless you. Right, so today we're talking about baptism in the Holy Spirit. I believe this is part of a series, and I believe you're also going on, is that right, to talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit more specifically in future. So this is baptism in the Holy Spirit. Um, today is a significant day in history, the 31st of July, actually 1588, uh, 434 years ago, um, England went into action against the greatest invasion force that had ever been mounted in the history of the world. Now, some of you may or may not guess that I'm talking about the Armada, the Spanish Armada. It was um, uh, 120 ships. Uh, they, each of them had on their, on their flag top uh, the red flag, a red cross of a, a religious crusade. The lead ship, which is a thousand ton galleon, actually had a huge banner which went from the top of the mast almost down to the waterline of the Virgin Mary kneeling before the cross. This was a banner that had been blessed by the Pope himself because this was a massive crusade launched by Philip II of Spain, whose Catholic Empire reached from Spain, Portugal, over to the South Americas, over to the Caribbean, over to West Africa, mounting this massive religious campaign against that heretic, Elizabeth I of England. They were going to do, do her in. He, this was God's chosen instrument, Philip II. So as he launched this armada, um, Duke, the Duke of Medina Sedona was in charge of the actual fleet itself. He was going over to the Netherlands to pick up the Duke of Palmer's army, which was over then. He was going to invade England. Hurriedly, the English launched their uh, uh, retaliation, which was uh, smaller ships. Uh, the guy called uh, Charles Howard with Francis Drake, uh, others with him, Frobisher and Hawkins, quickly mobilized. Their, their ships were smaller. Uh, they were bristling with cannon. They were really artillery ships rather than these great Spanish lumbering galleons which were there for sort of collision and, and mounting invasion parties onto ships. The British ships were smaller and on the 2nd of uh, August uh, the, the fiercest naval gun battle that had ever been waged until that point took place. Um, Otis or Portland Bill. Unfortunately, although the uh, lead ship, the flagship of the Spanish Armada took 500 shots it didn't sink, and in fact, the fact British were found it incredibly hard to sink or even to disperse this tightly huddled armada, tightly huddled in this sort of defensive uh, position, and they, they continued to sail towards the Netherlands to pick up the Duke of Palmer's army. It was still a real threat to the English nation. Now, here we come to the point. On the 6th of August, they docked at Calais, and at midnight, the Spanish looked out, and they saw on the horizon eight lights coming towards them. And they realized with absolute horror that the English had launched eight fire ships towards their armada. Now, if there's one thing a sailor in those days completely feared, it was fire. Everything on their ships was combustible, everything. Plus, believe it or not, most sailors and soldiers didn't swim. So this was a total panic situation. What they did, they, they just cut their anchors, they loosed, they loosed anchors, abandoned them, and they just sailed off as fast as they could, dispersing here and there. And pretty soon, this tightly huddled armada uh, was in just clumps of one and two along the Belgium-French uh, coast. These eight fire ships, just they are actually merchantmen of little value or significance to the English. They'd been piled high with sails and ropes. They'd poured pitch and tar and gunpowder on them and put them as sailing bombs just to sail into the Armada Calais Harbour. You can imagine the panic that was caused. The next, uh, on the 9th of August, the Battle of Gravelines was a decisive defeat, routed this Armada. And at the, at the end, out of the 120 ships, 45 never returned to Lisbon. Out of the 30,000 men, 10,000 never returned. It was the rise of England's navy as a great force on the earth. 
So why am I telling you all this stuff about the Armada? Because I believe that the devil himself, the God of this age who blinds the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel which displays the glory of Christ, who's the image of God, has launched this great armada against our nation, this armada of militant secularism, of pluralism, uh, uh, everything he can do, postmodernism, just to confuse and blind our nation. Many of our children, as you'll be aware, are growing up without barely any concept of God. Um, he's convinced us, hasn't he, that the situation is almost hopeless. The church is just a remnant now, just an aging remnant of people, and pretty soon will be defeated. How far that is from the truth, because God has started to launch his fire ships. Some of you may be aware of what happened on the 5th of July. Do you remember what happened then when a particular fire ship, Les Isaacs, sailed into the parliamentary prayer breakfast? Do you remember that? And uh, blazing with the fire of the Holy Spirit, Sajid Javid heard a, a sermon preached under the power of the Holy Spirit. His was the first of a chain reaction that brought down the government. God is looking in our day for fire ships who will sail into situations. And I want you to notice just two things. One is that there's not many needed, just, just this man, Les Isaacs. And he said, to, he said, I'm not much of a preacher. That was what he said afterwards. I'm not much of a preacher, but God had a plan. And the second thing is, but he wasn't the kind of like, God didn't use the, the great uh, flagships and admirals. He just used merchantmen of little value. You know, these normal, ordinary people like you and me, but anointed and equipped with the Holy Spirit. So... Let's ask God to come and fill us afresh with the Holy Spirit. I've asked at the end of this sermon whether we can sing that great hymn by William Booth who founded the Salvation Army, O God of burning, cleansing flame, send the fire, send the fire. Thy blood-bought gift today we claim, send the fire today. Look down upon this waiting host. Give us the promised Holy Ghost. We want another Pentecost. Send the fire. Well, I'm not sure we need another Pentecost. The first Pentecost was enough, but we just need to stop ignoring it. We just need to stop really functioning and moving in that first Pentecost that we had. Leonard Ravenhill, in his classic book, Why Revival Tarries, said this, the only reason we don't have revival is because we're willing to live without it. I don't know about you, but I am getting tired of the status quo. I'm getting desperate for the Holy Spirit to bring revival, aren't you? I think more and more churches now, we're getting serious about asking God to send his Holy Spirit into our lives and through us into our communities. A wonderful name, uh, Winky Prattney. Um, why does God love these people with these incredible names? But that's his name, Winky Prattney, a uh, New Zealander. Another revivalist, God doesn't do business with people who don't mean business with him. That's pretty, that pulls you up short, doesn't it? God doesn't do business with people who don't mean business with him. Are you tired of tick box Christianity? Fair weather friends of God. He'll go to church if it's convenient, if it suits them, but otherwise, oh, I've got a, another plan, you know, and something else has just come up. I need to manicure my nails, you know, something. Let, let's be Christians who are serious about God. This country needs revival. This country needs revival. So what is revival? Revival is a time when God pours out his Holy Spirit on whole, whole towns and regions. Many of you in Shrewsbury will be particularly aware of the Welsh Revival of 1904 when 100,000 people got swept into the kingdom of God in just six months. The Holy Spirit, John 16, 8, convicts the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. And as God indwells people, uh, Christians in the church, they just carry that conviction out into their communities. The Holy Spirit convicts people. They get cut to the heart. What must I do to be saved? And that's that revival spread out. I think they said by the end, it had spread right across the world. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones referred to by some as the greatest preacher of the 20th century, wrote in his book, Joy Unspeakable, this, the difference between the baptism in the Holy Spirit and revival is simply one of the number of people affected. 
Did you catch that? The difference between baptism in the Holy Spirit and revival is simply the number of people affected. I would define a revival, he said, as a large number, a group of people being baptized by the Holy Spirit at the same time, or the Holy Spirit falling upon, coming upon a number of people assembled together. So thank you, Dave and the elders, for speaking this morning on baptism in the Holy Spirit, because this morning we have this opportunity to trigger a revival in Shrewsbury that can spread throughout Shropshire, the UK, the world, who knows, as we open up ourselves and say, God, I want to be a living sacrifice for you. Come and flood my life, saturate me. I want to be baptized afresh in the Holy Spirit this morning. What is baptism in the Holy Spirit? Now, Listen, is it an initiation ceremony, much like the sacrament of water baptism after you've got saved? Is it something you do just as a one-off, sort of, yes, I've done that, now I can move on? Is that what baptism in the Holy Spirit is? No, it's very, very different. And I think it's really critical that you understand this, because otherwise this is going to trip you up. Baptism is is a word that simply means drenched. It's a Greek word, baptizo, it means drenched. It's not a one-off occurrence. We need constantly to be asking to be re-drenched. Ephesians 5.18, do not get drunk with wine, but keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit, present, continuous. Dave said uh, you had a, a... a a rather medical uh, picture, didn't you, just before the service about what baptism in the Holy Spirit was like in medical terms. And I appreciate this being a GP. Um, But he said that uh, when you get wax in your ears and you're not really hearing what's going on properly, uh, he he said you need to put ear drops in twice a day, just a couple of drops twice a day, and it keeps your hearing sharp. And he said, that's more like baptism in the Holy Spirit. That doesn't sound so dramatic, does it? But uh, just a twice daily... Yes, why not? Why not more often than twice? Just a refilling, a saturation of something otherwise could hinder you and stop you from functioning in the power of God. What does baptism do? It changes us irrevocably. 1 Samuel 10, I love that picture of Samuel anointing Saul poured olive oil on Saul's head, said, when you arrive in Gibeah, you'll meet a band of prophets. At that time, the Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you, and and you will prophesy with them. You will be changed into a different person. Isn't that great? You will be changed into a different person. How does that happen? We'll come on to that in a minute, but let me give you an example. In July 1979, 43 years ago, actually the 12th of July, I was just finishing my A-levels at Shrewsbury School. Um, My Latin teacher, who was also part of the chaplaincy team, a guy called Michael Tupper, uh, asked me if I wanted to come along to this tent crusade on Sundorn Park, pretty much where Shrewsbury Sports Village is today. Uh, I was curious and kind of open to any new experience, so I went with Michael Tupper, and we arrived at this uh, tent Now, I remember it as if it was yesterday. It was absolutely terrifying, I can tell you. There was no church building, just this tent. There was no organ. There was just guitars and tambourines. There was no familiar old, you know, ancient hymns that I was, uh, august hymns that I was used to. There were these new things called choruses. Uh, Some people were acting in most bizarre ways. Some of them were clapping. Others, I noticed, had their hands in the air. I was scared rigid. You know, what was going to happen next? Halfway through this meeting, the guy who was leading it, Don Double, said, well, you know, when you become a Christian, you receive the Holy Spirit. But if you want to be refilled with the Holy Spirit, then why don't you go through to the side tent over there? Well, I thought they're not charging any money for this. And, you know, uh, don't be shy. Have a try. So I thought, well, I'll go for it. So I went out to the side tent. And much to my relief, I recognized this person who had been sort of allocated to me to, to counsel me. And some of you may remember, this was a, a university student from Oxford, uh, a young man called Martin Charlesworth. And uh, so Martin said to me, what do you think of all this? And I said, I'm scared, Bridget. I said, I've never been to anything like this. It's far too much emotion for my liking. You know, I don't know what's going to happen next. He said, calm down. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And he went through a few scriptures with me and encouraged me to go through and receive prayer from a man called Mike Darwood. Well, Mike laid hands on me. Uh, he, he prayed for me to receive the fullness of 
baptism in the Holy Spirit. And then he said, I'm going to speak in tongues now. Would you like to join in with me? Uh, well, I articulated a few syllables. Uh, I wasn't sure what was happening or what was going on. But actually, what I did sense was an incredible sense of the love of God. Just that honeymoon began, and I'm still on that honeymoon today, 43 years later. Now, fast forward two years. Uh, this time, it's July 1981. My brother, Andrew, total, total pagan, gone to Bristol University, uh, just graduated. He's there with his girlfriend, living, living with his girlfriend, driving an MG midget, as cool as anything. Uh, see, People used to call him the icon of cool, my brother. And uh, he was just generally about to start his job as a civil engineer in London. I knew this was the last holidays I'd ever spend with my brother before he disappeared off into his working life and married life and whatever lay ahead of him. So I said to God, this is the last opportunity, God. You know, do something in his life. Well, Andrew was fine, except that he had this curious desire to find out what I was getting up to in church. So he asked me if he could come along to Cromwell Road Baptist Church, which some of you may know is the kind of mother the church to Barnabas Church. Well, I didn't want him to come. I mean, you know, the, the services at Cromwell Road were absolutely mad. You know, they were, they were very, uh, well, not what Andrew would be used to in a normal Anglican church. And I was just thinking, this is going to put him off a life if he comes anywhere near this church. I did not encourage him, but he insisted. We went to tea with, uh, uh, with uh, Carol and uh, Alan Lowe with their children, Adrian uh, and Alison. That was a good start. They're, they're normal, lovely people. Uh, and then we went to... Cromwell Road Baptist Church, this little hut. Well, it had been a very hot day, much like it was. It was, a, it was as I said, it was July, the, a very hot day. Actually, it was the 2nd of August. Very hot day. Uh, and while we were in there, kids started throwing stones onto the roof. Um, someone had a word of knowledge, and this was just my nightmare come true. Someone had a word of knowledge that we should go out into the car park. Uh, the nightmare got worse, because then the worship leader said, I believe that we should do the hokey cokey. And so we started doing the hokey cokey in the car park. And I was thinking, God, just kill me now. You know, <laughs> just swallow me up. And, uh, and then these kids started jeering at us on their chopper bikes, throwing things at us and just like laughing at us. Uh, Ron Lysett uh, preached us totally off the, off the spur of the moment sermon about the prodigal son. Uh, uh, thankfully, the sermon, everything ended. I got back into the car with Andrew. I remarked about the price of eggs and did he realize how expensive eggs were? You know, anything rather than talk about what had just happened. And I thought, that's it. He will never come to church with me again. Um, the next week, Sunday morning, he says, Jamie, can I come to church with you again this evening? I said, well, pff, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound. Before the service began, uh, I think it was Frank Davis said, there's, there's someone here that I need to speak to uh, before the service begins. There's someone who feels like they're on the outside, wants to come in. Andrew said, that's me. Uh, I said, well, go and, go and have a word with him. Uh, before that second service began, Andrew gave his life to Christ and uh, received the fullness of the Holy Spirit. He has been a fire ship for Jesus ever since. I was worried, actually. I thought, you know, Andrew's one of these faddy people. You know, he got into surf, into, uh, into skateboarding. He got into punk music, and then you're like, two months later it was gone he was on to the next thing you know I said is Christianity going to be like them I was kind of watching him is he just going to be a fad for Andrew no it wasn't 41 years later Andrew and his wife Sheila have lived the most radical life for Jesus seven years in Afghanistan serving God as missionaries that I think over 20 of their friends were actually martyred uh, while they were there in Afghanistan they were forcibly repatriated because it all got too dangerous to them but he carries on in love with Jesus the baptism in the Holy Spirit just puts this imprint of God's love into your heart. That's the practical side. Let's do some theology. <laughs> the Old Testament, I'm just going to scoot through this quite quickly. In the Old Testament, I think as we know, uh, the Holy Spirit came in power upon kings, prophets, priests for certain times, for certain tasks, and then seemed to sort of leave them. But then these prophets started saying, Joel said in Joel 2, 28, in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my manservants and my maidservants, I'll pour out my spirit. A man called Jeremiah said, 
said, this is the covenant I'll make with Israel after that time. I'll put my law in their minds and I'll write it on their hearts. They will be my people and I'll be their God. Ezekiel stands up and he says in Ezekiel 36, so I'll give them a new heart and put a new spirit in them. I'll take from them the heart of stone and I'll give them a heart of flesh. Something is stirring in the very heart of God, something unusual and new. Then there's 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And then John the Baptist stands up by the River Jordan and he says, you know, I baptize with water, but there's someone coming after me whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Spirit and with fire. And then Jesus comes and he, he talks to the woman at the well. Do you remember that? The woman at the, the, in Samaria. And he says to her, the water that I give you will become in you a spring welling up to eternal life. What's he mean? And then in John 7, on the greatest day of the feast of the tabernacles, Jesus stood up and in a loud voice, he cries out, anyone who believes in me, as the scripture has said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living, literally, rivers of living will flow from him. By this, he was referring to the Holy Spirit, who those who were be to believe in him were later to receive. So if you'd gone up to Jesus at that point and he said, Jesus, could I have some of those living waters? He would have said, no, because I was speaking prophetically. I've not yet been glorified. Jesus goes on, and as we know, he dies on the cross. Now, at that point, you'd have thought to yourself, well, I'm not sure the disciples are really in a fit state to continue building the church. Because actually, look at the inner three. I mean, James and John, these sons of thunders, you know, God, this is just after Jesus had explained to them about his suffering. God, can I sit at your right hand and my brother on your left hand? You know, we want to be celebrities. And uh, Peter says, the others may desert you, but I won't. I'll stick by you through thick and thin. And then later that night, this little slave girl says, weren't you with him? Weren't you one of his followers? And he starts pouring down curses and saying, no, I never knew him. And you think, really? Those are the inner three, the special ones, you know, that and the rest of the disciples all deserted him after the cross. And you think, what hope is there? Well, you can see why people say Act 1-8 is the key to understanding what goes on in the book of Acts. Wait in Jerusalem until you receive power, and you'll buy my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Boy, did they need that visitation, that empowering of the Holy Spirit. And so... Pentecost comes, as you remember, tongues of fire fall on the 120 gathered in the upper room. Peter, who just six weeks before had totally denied uh, all knowledge in, in Jesus, stands up and with such courage and major conviction, he, he preaches this sermon, blockbuster sermon, and 3,000 get saved. A man, Philip, goes out to Samaria and uh, he preaches with signs and wonders, Demons are cast out of people. The lame are healed. A man called Simon the Sorcerer thinks, wow, I pay good money for this. You know, amazing uh, salvations break out. But something slightly strange happens. And that is that um, Peter and John are dispatched from Jerusalem and find out that none of those converted had actually received the Holy Spirit. So they lay hands on them and they receive the Holy Spirit. And then we get Paul, the next chapter, Acts 9. The most con famous conversion in the, in the history of the world. This man gets converted on the road to Damascus. Three days later, this unknown chap, Ananias, lays hands on him to receive the Holy Spirit. Three days later. Strange. Then in uh, Acts 10, we get... Um, uh, Peter going down to the, to the Gentiles, which was totally unexpected. You know, we thought we were talking here about the covenant people of God, the Jews. But no, he gets sent to the Gentiles. He starts to share the gospel. The Holy Spirit breaks out in power. They all start speaking tongues and praising God. And he thinks, hold on, I better catch up. Something's going on here. We better quickly baptize them because they've clearly become Christians here. And then finally, we get Paul visiting uh, the Ephesian uh, apostles in, in, in Acts 19. And he says, have you received the Holy Spirit? And they didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. And so he has to baptize them. And as they're still dripping, he prays for them to receive the Holy Spirit. So question, is it two experiences or is it one? I mean, in four of those, you know, if not five, it seems that this has happened on a different occasion. They were definitely saved. And then they definitely needed this baptism in the Holy Spirit. Well, I'm not sure what to say about that, except perhaps to say that, that 
qualitatively, it's the same thing. It's the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1 clearly says that, you know, when you were converted, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, didn't he, in, in John 3, 6, the spirit gives birth to spirit. The flesh gives birth to flesh. But then baptism in the Holy Spirit sounds a bit different from you were marked with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit it doesn't sound the same, does it, when it says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses. And actually, interestingly, it's, it's not the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. It's Jesus, the one who comes after me. He baptizes you with the Holy Spirit. So, so quantitatively, it's, it's, it's different. There's something more powerful happening to you uh, on this sort of second visitation. But actually, it's not a second, is it? It's a third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, thousandth, five thousandth, ten thousandth baptism, soaking, saturation, drenching in the Holy Spirit. So it's not a second. It's, it's from then on, guys, it's the drops in your ears every twice a day. That's what you need. You need this revisitation of the Holy Spirit. What are the benefits of the Holy Spirit? Why was Saul changed into a different person? Why was my brother changed into a different person? Actually, what really happened there? Romans 5.5, 5, I think, is critical to understanding this. The love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. The love of God. You suddenly get this download of the height and the depth and the width and the length of God's love coming into you. And what does 1 John 5? 418 say it says perfect love drives out fear so suddenly you get a download of this in infinite love of God the height and the depth and the width and the length of it all trace of fear begins to evaporate just like the wax in the ear evaporates just fear goes and you become changed into a different person so you receive courage you become a fire ship have you wanted to be a fire ship for God do you want to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice to say, God, I don't know, I seem to just lack courage nowadays. You know, I go into a social situation with my friends or work or family or colleagues, and I just don't seem to have that passion, that courage to really speak out for the gospel. I kind of just go with the flow, and I'm kind of on automatic pilot a bit. Lord, make me into a fire ship again. Do you want that sort of experience this morning? God, come and let the fire fall on me again. Cause me to be like that fire ship going into the Spanish Armada, you know, striking fear into the heart of the enemy like Les Isaacs going into that parliamentary prayer breakfast just anointed with the Holy Spirit God make me like that again that's what I want to do in my generation for you you receive the fruits of the Holy Spirit and notice one of them actually is self-control did you notice that self-control you know in Ephesians 5 Paul says do not get drunk with wine but be filled with the Holy Spirit what a contrast you're drunk with wine you're incapacitated you're confused with the Holy Spirit, you're energized. You've got self-control. It's a tremendous, it's a tremendous sort of contrast, isn't it? Be filled with the Spirit. And then the gifts of the Spirit, which you will be dealing with shortly. But when I, when I was prayed for, as I said, by Mike Darwood, he prayed in tongues over me, encouraged me to pray in tongues. And I started to articulate a few syllables in tongues. And actually, then I forgot about it for a good six months. I went off to Pakistan. And when I was in Pakistan, uh, a missionary said to me, do you speak in tongues? And I said, well, someone tried to, to pray for me once to receive tongues, but I, I don't think it worked. And she said, are you sure it didn't work? Because, you know, in John 10.10, 10, it says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Uh, are you sure he didn't just steal it off you? Maybe you did receive it. So I said, oh, maybe that's true. Maybe I should start this process of beginning to articulate tongues. You know, God doesn't take hold of your tongue and your diaphragm and your lips and he starts doing it for you. You have to do it yourself. But you're saying, Holy Spirit, would you come and give me words? Would you give me uh, utterance as I start, start to speak? And so I became more and more fluent and you start to edify yourself. Never. Paul says, doesn't he, in 1 Corinthians 14, I would that all of you speak in tongues. Whoever speaks in tongues edifies themselves. So it's an important gift and something that you can receive if you you want it um, if you ask him for it let's close by saying three things one is that in in, John, in uh, Luke 11 um, Jesus speaking about the Holy Spirit uh, spoke about three clear barriers to receiving the Holy Spirit the first one being doubt 
I don't know if you've been in this situation where you thought God will bless everyone else in this room, but actually I am the single exception in this room. I can believe that everyone else will receive tongues and, you know, receive blessing from God, but actually I seem to be the one who God bypasses for one reason or another. Chronic seekers who never seem to actually receive. I don't know if you can identify with that. Um, I've known plenty of people like that. Jesus said, if you ask, you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will will be opened for anyone who asks receive whoever seeks finds whoever knocks the door is open to them in other words six times Jesus said do not doubt God's promise is secure we've sung about that this morning if God says it he will definitely do it and the second barrier that people often have is is um uh, of, of inadequacy. God, if you only you knew what a sinner I am. You know, I'm just so sinful. I don't deserve it at all. Well, fortunately, it says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might be the righteousness of God in Christ. Do you remember that? We're washed in the blood of Jesus. Satan is the accuser of the devil, but actually we have had our, the righteousness of Christ imputed to us. We are righteous in Christ. All you have to do is receive Christ as your personal savior and then be thirsty Remember John 7, Jesus said when he stood up at the feast, whoever is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. That is the only qualification that you really need. The second, the third one is fear. I've heard about people who've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. They go really weird, you know, really weird. I mean it. You know, <laughs> I don't want anything like that happening to me. Well, really? I've not known that. Everyone I've known of who's received the, 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 the baptism in the Holy Spirit has come alive, has lost fear, has been, developed self-control, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, meekness, temperance, and faith. They've suddenly developed in their maturity. They suddenly found that they love Jesus more than they've ever loved him before. Fear has been dispelled and dispersed from their life. You know, Jesus said, if, if, God being, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will God give good gifts to those who ask him? You know, whoever asks for a, for a fish, would I give him a snake? Or for an egg, would you give him a scorpion? No. God will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. So let's ask this morning. So if you, I'm going to ask the worship band to come and we're going to sing um, that wonderful hymn uh, by William Booth, Send the Fire. And during that hymn, I think we can all just say to God, God, would you refill me with your Holy Spirit? Would you come and just really empower me to be a fire ship, to, to bring revival to Shrewsbury, to my workplace, my family, my friends, my street. I want to be that fire ship for you. Come and saturate me, cast out fear. Come and do a new thing in me. So if that's you, we'll just join, join in this hymn and we'll all sing it together. If you this morning have never received Christ as your personal saviour, then that is an imperative for receiving the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up and he said, it's, if whoever's been baptised and, re and received Jesus, then it's for you. And uh, if you remember in Cornelius' household, people just received the Holy Spirit before they're even baptised. So if, if you want, if you've never received Jesus Christ as your saviour, then I think you should come forward during this hymn and we will have the, the, the ministry team come and pray for you. If you've never received for the first time baptism in the Holy Spirit, if you're seeking gifts of the Holy Spirit, then during this hymn, come forward and we'll have the ministry team come and pray for you. If you're longing to speak in tongues or to develop in your gifts, then we'll have the, the, the ministry team come and pray for you.